second faculty showcase of the month of October. Um, we've got a lot going on this month, and I want to, before uh, we have our first presenter come, I wanted to remind you next Tuesday at 3 o'clock, a half hour earlier uh, than we normally do these, we're going to have a presentation um, by uh, Dr. Brown, Dr. Nickel, and myself on the uh, subject of the 500th anniversary of the uh, Reformation, and that will be uh, um, here in the reading room at 3 o'clock next Tuesday on um, the anniversary, the actual anniversary, which is a nice change. So we want to uh, invite you to come to that, tell your friends if they can uh, be around. Also, we'll have some uh, little handouts. If you have not um, uh, joined the uh, Friends of the Library, we encourage you to uh, consider doing so for as much or as little. Uh, memberships start at uh, $25 a year, and uh, they go up to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if you're interested in, in, in going that direction. And, and we, we, we appreciate uh, uh, any and all uh, joining as we uh, try to do some things here in the library to go forward a little bit if you can uh, if you'd like to uh, join that, uh, we would appreciate that. Myself or Janet Guinness is here to uh, answer any questions you might have. Uh, we have two uh, speakers today, uh, two uh, um, somewhat uh, divergent books, but we want to uh, begin with uh, Jay Blauser. Jay is our Director of Campus Sustainability, um, joined UNCP in 2014 as the university's first sustainability director and chief sustainability officer. Um, was in uh, the Air Force for six years, worked at uh, Fayetteville State before coming uh, uh, as a construction project manager uh, beginning in 2005. And has a degree in architecture, passion for sustain, sustainable development and, des and design, and that was uh, one of the reasons he came here. And you would uh, um, think with that, and, and with a, a master's degree in human resources development, that he has a, a learned book on um, sustainability and uh, um, personnel management and things like that. He has uh, something uh, a little bit different. He has a uh, children's book that he's going to present to you, Taylor's Trampoline Travels. And uh, Jay, happy to have you here. Can you guys? Yeah, that's loud. It works. All right. How's everybody doing? Yeah. All right, I'm Jay Blauser. Uh, this book I did was actually fun. This was a fun project. Uh, what made it so fun is I got to do it with my daughter. So I've got, a, I've got a teenage daughter, she's 18, and so we actually did this book together. So that's, that's just, you know, making memories, that's priceless. But uh, before I get into it, I want to kind of set the tone of kind of wh where this whole thing came about. How do we end up, her and I, doing the book together? That number ring a bell with anybody? Think about sustainability. Do we decimal now? But we are in the library. I see where, I see where you made the connection. Anybody? That's actually the current number today. That's the amount of carbon dioxide in terms of parts per million that's in Earth's atmosphere today. Okay? This, oh, that's going to be hard to read. I'm sure you guys probably can't even read that. I can barely read it. Um, right here is a line. This is 300 parts per million CO2, Earth's atmosphere. This goes back 650,000 years. Uh, they were able to get that data by doing ice core drilling. Uh, and you can see it never went above 300 until along 1940, 50-ish, a little sometime after the Industrial Revolution, and we started uh, extracting all the fossil fuels and burning them and how we generate power, coal, natural gas, gasoline, diesel, all those good things. Uh, but you can see where we're at today. It's pretty much took a straight upward trend and we're now at 406. So that's kind of, uh, I want to set the stage kind of where this whole thing came about. That's, uh, 
myself and my daughter both were kind of passionate about trying to do something about this because um, it's not too late to fix it. So the, the good news is, is it's still, we can still fix this, um, but we need to kind of get with the program. So that's kind of where the thinking, where the book came from. So now let me back up. Okay, back up. I'm backing way up. This is actually me and my daughter. She's 18 today. Um, so every night when she was old enough to understand what was going on, I'd read to her every night. Tons of books, all kinds of books, children's books. Um, when she was about seven years old, she actually told me this story. And it's pretty much the story of our book. Uh, we kind of added the environmental component to it, but the storyline itself, she actually told it to me. I don't know how she came up with it. And when she did, I was like, wow, that would be an awesome book. We should write that one day. So that's kind of how this thing came about. So about 10 years after that, uh, which now, this is more current. This was actually this past June. Uh, she graduated from high school. Now she's a freshman in college. And that's when we wrote the book. So we wrote the book when she was actually 17, finished it when she was 18, uh, and we got it out, out there published. It's actually, we used, uh, being independent authors, we used, you guys may have heard of it, Lulu. It's actually a local company. They're actually based out of Morrisville, between Raleigh and Chapel Hill. So that's kind of an important thing to me too. I like to work with local people when I can. That's always a good thing. Um, and we got our book put out there. Here's kind of what the cover looks like. But uh, to summarize sort of what it's about and, and our intent, it's a children's book that we wanted to expose kids and their parents to what would, what would a child going around, say bouncing on a trampoline, in this particular book, the character bounces on a trampoline, goes up in the clouds, comes out of the clouds, lands in different places every time they land somewhere different. Um, Hawaii, Japan, India, different places. Well, as they're going around to these different places, they're seeing uh, sustainable development, sustainable technology in the illustrations of the book. They're not always talked about. Some of them are, but not everything's mentioned. We wanted it to be seen as the norm, so the, the standard. So when these, when these kids are going around, they're seeing solar panels wind turbines and electric cars charging and recycling and all these things that, that we're trying to do today as the standard. This is just normal. So we didn't make a really big deal about it in the book. We wanted it to be somewhat subtle to come across as this is the norm. And so that's kind of how our book came about. Let me show you a couple more things here. If I can get this to work. So that was back, back, back when, when she was little. Now here's more current. She's a normal, normal kid. This is, this is her and her boyfriend at the prom. Um, in that book, uh, her and Reggie, who's a little stuffed animal raccoon, and that's her Reggie. She's obviously the character in the book, uh, and that stuffed animal is actually a real stuffed animal, she has. Uh, but that's her today. Other things that I've got going on besides the projects on this campus, which keep me quite busy. Um, I'm also a volunteer and part-time firefighter EMT, uh, where I live in my community in Beaver Dam, and I kind of passionate about motorcycles. I don't know if anybody here other than me likes to ride motorcycles, but that freedom of being on a bike is kind of, if you, if you own one, you know what I mean, and don't have to say anything else. But, uh, that's my decompression and my stress release. Um, but that's our book. It was fun. Um, the coolest thing about it is it's a memory that we got a chance to make together, and it's something that we're both passionate about. Um, it's not going to be on the New York Times bestseller list or anything like that. It's not necessarily a scholarly read, but uh, for what we were aiming for, uh, we think it's cool, um, and it was really fun. So I guess this will be a good time to ask questions if there are any. What is the target reading age? The uh, elementary school. So we, we wanted, we actually, preschool through the parents, parents reading to the kids, uh, and elementary, I guess all the way up to middle school. Yes. Um, how do I turn that off?
Yeah, in, in the book, um, there's, a, there's a mention of solar panels, and you see them in the illustrations. It's actually when, the, when they're in India. They land on the back of an elephant uh, going in a caravan, and there's solar panels in the background, and it's just mentioned. Uh, there's some wind turbines when they're in Hawaii. They're kind of in the background. They, they land at a luau, and there's the dancers and spinning the fire and all that kind of good stuff. And there's wind turbines in the background. It's kind of mentioned. Recycling containers, electric cars. Uh, they land in a rickshaw in Tokyo, and they see cars being plugged in and charging. Um, it's, it's mentioned, but it's not like the focus of the book. Um, they're also learning about different cultures along the way. And everywhere they land, they hear, they're greeted with um, uh, a greeting of that language of where they landed. So there's a little bit of that involved in it, but we wanted it to be part of the book, but be subtle. So it comes across as this is the way it always is. This is normal. Not like, oh, this is something new and different. We wanted it to be, no, this is, this is just the standard. Yes. I have a question. Are the elements of sustainability that appear at the different locations, are they, do they actually exist in those locations, or are they, is this fantasy? No. This, it's actually real. It, it, okay. it's, okay. it, it is happening. It's not like what I would call the standard and the norm, which is kind of the way we're portraying it in the book. That part is a little, I'm fast forwarding a few years, but all the technology and then all these places, it, it exists. It's there. It's not prevalent. but. As, as prevalent as we'd like it to be. So how would you, you would tell our plan, how do you market this so that it might get adopted like in K4 through second or third grade or something? For years I had up the, the, the council that kind of education. So what we've been trying to do is find books, even for four to seven and eight year olds that taught that taught economic, the economic way of thinking oftentimes in very, very subtle ways. So sometimes it would, it would be teaching the economic way of thinking through literature. Uh, nothing in there about economics, right? Yeah. But, but it planted the seed. Right, seed planting, yeah. So, so I mean, is, is there a plan to try and get this adopted? Uh, yeah, I probably need to figure that out. Um, being an independent publisher and using yeah. uh, Lulu, uh, it's not really, doesn't come with a marketing team or any of that, what you talked about, so it's pretty much... Look at you guys sitting here. Yeah, so... I'm all, he's all about that. <laughs> no, I really do think that, that there, there might be a market for uh, such a book. Yeah, I don't know how you can talk about any ideas and how would you go about it. You know, you know, you know, you know like I have a very good connection with like the Montessori schools nationally, you know, so it might be a kind of thing that if you could sell that to the right person, right. that they might be an adopter of this. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and it would be exposure to more people, which is kind of what we would like to do ultimately. Yeah. Well, you're about the exposure, I'm about the sales. <laughs> <laughs> True business man. True, yeah. Yes? Uh, for the target audience of so the children reading this book, what would be the greatest, like, uh, what might be the greatest sort of, what's the greatest meaning of the album? Like, what will they, after they read the book, what will they understand the world they didn't understand before? What would they, like, what would they take away? Hmm, good question. Um, hmm. Um, well, in the book, the recurring theme is every time they go up in the clouds and they come down somewhere different, they're always greeted. It's always a friendly experience. So somebody in a different place, Greeks them in their native language, and it's always friendly. And, uh, and let's see, in Italy, they they land in a gondola boat, and the couple's eating spaghetti, and which came from a lo local farm, and that's kind of in the background. But they share the food with them, and so uh, going all around the world, interacting with people on a friendly it's, friendly basis. It's more like a sort of introductory, introductory sort of digital culture. It is. It is. And, and, I have to go yeah. myself. They're not, they're not reading it. It's, like, it's sort of based on sort of marketing as well as like, what types of books. So, like, okay, we're going to get the culture now. They're not going to say that it's a slow movie. Yeah, exposure to different people from different places, different cultures, positive experiences. Uh, and then, subtly, they're seeing this sustainable technology as 
Oh, that's just the way it's done. That's just, just normal. Any more questions for me? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. And, and uh, Jay has some uh, copies of the book uh, up front here, so if anyone wants to uh, um, do some business uh, with, with Jay after uh, after the next presentation and during the reception, they'll be welcome to do that. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. John Parnell, uh, Professor and Belt Chair of Management, uh, uh, Marketing and International Business in the uh, School of Business. And uh, um, as we have uh, Jay uh, um, in our facilities and sustainability department writing a children's book, uh, Dr. Parnell is, is going to talk about his uh, teen romance novel he's written. No, just <laughs> kidding. He's, he's here to talk about his uh, book today, Strategic Management Theory and Practice. It's the fifth edition. Um, it's one of the um, uh, key texts in the, in the uh, um, field of business on this subject, it's used here, it's used uh, in many places elsewhere. He has um, uh, been in uh, teaching for over 20 years and uh, administrating as one of the uh, 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 most knowledgeable uh, individuals in this field in the country. And uh, we're pleased to have him uh, here on the faculty at UNCP and pleased to have him come and make his presentation. John? Thanks so much. I don't know how I can follow that presentation. Beautiful daughter, uh, Jay. That's really, uh, that's awesome. I guess where you had a lot of fun writing the book and your daughter's there, I'm thinking of my kids knocking on the door when I'm trying to write this one. So uh, it's kind of an interesting experience. This is a copy of the book uh, in, in fifth edition. Um, and what I decided to do this time is to take a little different approach than I usually take when I make presentations. No tie, no jacket, no PowerPoint. Just talk. You know, and, and see how that works out. Um, because I think there, with, with sort of a mixed audience here, uh, there's some things we can talk about in terms of the process of writing the book and how the industry, the book industry, has changed. But then uh, look at uh, eight different issues that I think cross uh, boundaries. There are things that would be interested, uh, interesting to folks outside of business. Things you can can relate to, no matter what your your background or field of expertise would be. Now, I guess to start, um, I've had multiple publishers. Uh, I was just thinking I counted five. I probably forgot one in there of, of books because of all the acquisitions in the, in the textbook industry. It's something we, uh, if you know much about that, we talk a lot about textbooks, and the first thing that people say is cost, right? How expensive are they in $250 books and things like that? So we've had all this turbulence in the industry. One publisher buying out another publisher and going online, and this, that, and the other, and that's led to, uh, to a lot of movement around and different uh, changes in the industry. So it's been, been an adventure over the years getting to the current um, edition. Um, one of the, uh, the trends that we see right now in just writing a book is they want to know, can this be uh, delivered online? Do you have something that allows us to deal with online students? Of course, we, we deliver a lot of our hours online as well, and uh, a lot of universities are interested in that. If you just have a hard copy, it just doesn't work well uh, for an online audience. They want other things to go with it. I will say proudly, this book uh, sells in the range of $39 to $68, which uh, is uh, one of the least expensive strategy books in the field. Uh, and the book is for the capstone course that is offered. Uh, there's a capstone course in strategy offered at the undergraduate and graduate levels in most universities. So if you take, if you get a business major, that's the last uh, last course that you take. So it's the course that pulls everything together, the, the other functional areas, marketing, production, finance, and so forth, and then sort of paints on top of them a strategy theory, if you will, a little bit of looking at that. So this is that last course that you take in undergraduate and graduate. This course is, pri or this book is primarily written for the undergraduate mo uh, market uh, because I like to think it's the most readable book in the field. 
Um, I know one of the things that impressed me going through college is it just seemed like the textbook authors did all they could to confuse you, right? You were reading and they just put all this jargon in there to make you think they know a lot more than you do. And in reality, they're talking about simple issues that are, aren't quite as complicated. So I've, from the beginning, I've tried to you know, tone down the writing and be a little bit more conversational and, and work with some, some different examples uh, that students can relate to so they can, can read it and, and feel good about what they're, they're covering. Uh, the, the, the book covers uh, what we call the strategic management model, where if you were to look at a company and think about what that company is trying to do strategically, how it's trying to be successful, uh, what does it do to, uh, to perform well, to make its money, to serve its community, uh, what are the, all the considerations that go into that? Uh, this book covers from one end to another a process that uh, allows students to work through that model to, uh, to take any company, whether it's a local hardware store or McDonald's or, or any business that you would have and, and work from one end to the other. Uh, so it integrates uh, all the different areas of, of strategy and I think the most commonly cited uh, material in the book is the Wall Street Journal. So lots of examples. This company did this, that company did that, this is going on in, in this industry and so forth. A, a way of trying to make it current and, and make, it, make it real. I, and I mentioned early on I'd like to just talk briefly about eight issues that I pulled out of the book that I think transcend traditional uh, lines. So whatever uh, background you have, you might find these interesting, uh, and of course they're interesting thinking in terms of how some of the things we see going on on our campus, uh, things we see uh, going on in our country as well. The first big issue that, that the book looks at, I think is this notion, is formal strategic planning dead? And of course, you might say if it is, well, why do we have a book, right? Uh, but you know, the book, it's not really the way I would see it because uh, I think formal strategic planning in many respects is dead. The idea that you write this big plan, you put it on the shelf, and then you get together every couple of years to revise it, and you put it back on the shelf, nobody pays attention to it. That's not what we're seeing today um, in, 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 among most executives in, in major companies. You're seeing quick decision making. Uh, strategy is not a, a plan, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of, of responding to things that change. You think about uh, the pace of the world, just, just click on the internet, things that used to take, uh, many of you being, not being as old as I am, you don't know this, but there was a time when you couldn't get information right away, right? Things that took you a while to, to see what was going on. But the pace of the world has, has, has become so rapid now that you have to be able to make quick decisions. Uh, the global influences and all of that, so that's one of the things that we're seeing, and that's one of the, the ways that the book tries to to take a different approach. Even though it, it follows the notion of writing a strategic plan, it's really more about learning how to think strategically, how to see opportunities, how to respond to them um, in, in a reasonably quick way so your organization doesn't get behind as a, as a result. Another uh, issue that uh, is a really, really prevalent in this book is how to deal with all the data that you have. And I, I go back to when I think about years ago when I was going through school and I recently took this course, one of the points that was made was, you know, hey, you have to go find information about your company and your industry in order to make the decisions. Well, today, in most instances, it's not about finding information, it's about de determining which information you want to spend time with. There's so much out there, uh, especially if you're talking about a domestic company, a company in the U.S. Uh, where there's just a lot of research. So the, the challenge now is to find to figure out where you want to spend your time so that you can make good decisions as opposed to trying to find that information. Uh, and the third issue, I think, is, is one that is near and dear to all of us, and that's the ethics and corporate social responsibility. If you uh, are familiar with the business curriculum, every course has the ethics and CSR chapter and has that whole uh, uh, consideration. But I, I take a little bit different approach in, in this in this book, looking at the differences between ethics and CSR, because ethics is really about individual decision making. It's about you getting up as a manager and going to work and making individual decisions that you have to make on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, whether to fudge on your expense account or, or what you're going to do with an ad campaign. So these are ethical decisions that you would make. Corporate social responsibility is this notion that the organization should be doing something beyond just earning a profit. And if so, what should that organization be doing? Who does it serve? Who is it accountable to? And all of that. So there's a chapter, it's one of the thickest chapters in the book that gives a lot of 
time and attention to this because it's, to me it's not as simple as just saying, hey, let's all do ethics and CSR. It's about understanding what that really means. What does it mean that you have a social responsibility? What does it mean to be ethical? These are tough questions and try to unpack those uh, in the book. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth theme or, or big issue that, uh, that I try to pull out is the idea that all business is global, and I guess if we're connecting our presentations, that was one of the things that jumped out. You mentioned India, and India and China are frequently uh, referenced in, in the book. Uh, in fact, the whole idea of international business or inter international strategy is probably at some level uh, passe, because how do you have business that's not internationalist? Now, even if you're a small company here operating, you're probably getting materials that are made somewhere else. Uh, you may be marketing your products elsewhere. So there's a strong global dimension uh, in the book. Uh, and that's something that I think is really important in, this, in the field. The fifth issue that uh, I'll, I'll pull out is one that relates more to strategy, um, than to, to creating strategies. And if, if you've been at Pembroke uh, long enough, you know every year it seems that the message from administrations, we have to do more with less, right? They don't use those words, but essentially that's you know, budget cuts, but we have to do more, cut the budget, we have to do more. And this is a real challenge that we have because strategy is about fundamentally making choices, okay? You can't do everything. You can't make products to make everyone happy. You can't do the lowest cost, have the lowest cost product, lowest price, and then all of a sudden have the highest quality. You have to make choices. You have to make decisions. But more and more companies are being challenged to find ways to make those decisions in a way that does allow them to be the best of multiple worlds if they can pull that off. To find ways to have your cake and eat it too if you can. And this is one of the real themes in strategy right now is finding a way to survive. A uh, company, a good example in, in, that we are all familiar with in corporate America is Amazon. And Amazon launched what we call mass customization, decided that you can provide something that looks like individualized service and at the same time provide this mass model where you get the economies of scale. It's always interesting if I go on, on Amazon, it seems to know who I am, right? Welcome back and it makes suggestions of what I can buy and all these kinds of things. And it doesn't know me from Adam, right? But it's got an algorithm back there that's figured out that if I bought X, then I might want to buy Y now and then maybe Z later. So they found a way to somewhat customize in a very inexpensive manner. So Amazon's having its cake and eating part of it too. Not the perfect company, no company is, but that's the real challenge that, that companies are faced with, finding ways to, 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 at some level, if not be all things to all people, get a lot done with, with fewer resources, a real, a real competitive challenge. Uh, the sixth issue, and here's our overlap, is, is going to be sustainability. And sustainability from two standpoints. One is from uh, com what we call competitive advantage, or being able to stay ahead of your competition. That's difficult. You have a good product today, or have to do something better than your competition today. Tomorrow they have a better idea, or they've copied it. You have to figure out what you're going to do to, to, to stay ahead of them. And sustaining that to be successful over time is very difficult. That's why a lot of the largest, if you look at any list of, of, of major corporations over the years, you'll see that a lot of them were around 50 years ago or gone today because it is so difficult to compete. But the other side of sustainability is, is the environment and dealing with resources and resource challenges. We have populations and such. And I, I saw a photo that sometimes photos just tell a thousand words. And I was thinking, you mentioned India, Jay, I was thinking about this. It's in the Weekend's Wall Street Journal that there's a picture out of India of a stream that talked about environmental challenges. And there was this big pipe that was coming into the stream with just stuff dumping out into it. And, and this is something we don't think about much in this country because I, you know, it, to, to us, of course, you're not going to just, I mean, I don't know what was in that pipe, you know, but it's obviously not good. We, we don't think about things like that in, in the U.S. because we sort of figured out ways to work around that. And we, we, we have, uh, at least in theory, we have better ways to handle our waste, and we sort of challenged ourselves to deal with those, those issues. But in lots of many parts of the world, that's still commonplace. So you have those kinds of issues that go on. So balancing all that and figuring out how to manage or to deal with the environmental sustainability with the, the, the need for companies to, to thrive is, is an important issue. Issue number seven is one that's a real trend that we're seeing in the field now, and, and I think we, we can all experience it um, in our work lives, and that's an emphasis on human resources. 
you know, years ago we called this personnel, and there's still a few companies around that have personnel departments, and that's kind of like cattle. You know, it doesn't really appreciate the individual nature of of somebody, right? So we use the word human resources as a way to express that that individuals are valuable, and that means their talents, their you know their need for a challenging work environment. It's difficult for companies to attract good people and then retain them. Uh, and we used to live in an interesting world. Sometimes it's, it might be hard to find a job, you know, in some areas, but in other areas and sometimes in those companies, uh, the companies are struggling on the other side saying, we can't find good people. You know, we're, we're having to retrain and we, we need to hold on to the talent that we have. But from this perspective, talent and the, the human resources you have is really the greatest source of competitive advantage that you can get. Everything else can be bought and sold. They can buy your technology, they can obtain warehouses, they can do whatever they want to mimic what your company is doing. But if you have good people, you have creativity, and you have that package, then you've got something that you can leverage long term. And that's a theme of the, uh, of the, the textbook. The, the closing the issue that I'll close with today, and one that is closed in, in the book, is that of crisis management. Uh, and this is. Um, one of my personal passions and one of the issues that people don't think too much about, but I think we overuse the word crisis in everyday language. You know, my daughter always talks about crisis, right? But that's not exactly what we mean. We're talking about organizational crisis, things that, that threaten the very survival of the company. So you can do everything right strategically and do all, everything in the, this book tells you to, right? Uh, if, it, if, it, if it's right, you can do all of that and still, something comes around, there's a boycott of your products, there's a fire in your facility, there's a, a hurricane that wipes out your plant. There's something that comes in and creates that threat to the organization. And, and we look at this um, really in the book from, from an organizational standpoint, because when you have a crisis, you can look at it from a government standpoint, a government response, you can look at it from a human standpoint, loss of life, there are different perspectives, but the book looks at it from the organization standpoint. What do you do? as a company to prepare for these crises and, and deal with them. One of the, the more famous, uh, in fact, probably the most famous historical organizational crisis was Johnson & Johnson Tylenol. This, uh, I won't give you the whole story. It's a, it's a long one that if you Google it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Back in Chicago years ago, um, somebody had laced cyanide, or laced Tylenol capsules with cyanide. And to this day, they never figured out exactly who did it, but um, I think there were seven or eight deaths as, as a result of that. And people, there's a big scare in Chicago, you know, should we take Tylenol? And Johnson & Johnson really stepped up, and this is a, one of the examples where companies really did the right thing, the way they managed it. Clearing the shelves, you know, going around communicating, dealing with medical issues and all of that. And actually came back with what we see now as, as caplets. We don't see capsules that much anymore. In the pharmacies, we see the caplets because you can't open a caplet and then close it and put it back on the shelf. So lots of different uh, innovations that came out of this entire crisis. But an example of how a company was on the verge, literally, of losing, uh, maybe not going under because Johnson Johnson was diversified, but certainly losing that particular uh, product. It gone from, I think, 35% market share down to 5% almost overnight with that crisis. Uh, but then was able to turn around, and today Tylenol is still a, a very well-respected brand, and Johnson & Johnson is well-respected as a, as a company. So we talked a lot about crisis management and being able to, to see those things that you don't always think about on a daily basis and, uh, and, and prepare for that. So in closing, I'd just like to say this, um, well, I'd like to say this book was a lot of fun. I guess, uh, you know, I hear Jay talk about his, uh, his experience, maybe it wasn't so much, but it is uh, professionally rewarding to write. A, uh, a textbook because it's a different kind of research. It's a, a, a way to assimilate everything that's done and try to make sense of it. Uh, there's a lot out there uh, on, I guess, virtually any topic that you that you might teach about. But this is a chance to, to take it all together and, and put together in a way that you think you know, this is the most important package that we can provide you know, for, our, for our students and for students in other universities to, to equip them to, to run organizations. So, with that, thank you very much uh, for your time. And any questions, comments, I'd be happy to, to entertain. John, I have a question. I know you're a very uh, experienced uh, and that teacher, be a great classroom teacher, but I also know you're very effective online. And I was just wondering, in the textbook industry, are, are authors 
much like yourself putting together like five to seven minute uh, videos that you might then sell or package with your book uh, to be used uh, with perhaps an online course? That, that's a great question. In fact, what the publishers themselves are often creating these. So many of the publishers, will, even if they have several strategy books, they will have common videos to use with the strategist. And this is one of the things as an author that was frustrating. Years ago, when, when I would write the book, that was it. And now, if you don't watch it out there, they want you to update a page every day and tell you what happened today that relates to your book. And you can spend your entire life on that. So it's a very competitive market. The publishers are providing a lot of that, provide a lot of videos. I provide links to uh, on YouTube. And they're, they're already there, great examples, a lot of material that's available. But it is important for the online audience because if, you have, if I have an online class, I want more than just a physical book. I want something that my students can, can integrate in an online experience. I want some ability to, to, to use the online links and be able to see what's going on, leverage that. Uh, because online is different, a different um, approach. So it's not that we want to just duplicate what we're doing in class. We want to leverage what we're able to do it. So yeah, that's, that's a big issue. I will say in many respects that's been bad news for those of us in the right, in the textbook right industry because it puts a lot of pressure on us uh, to turn around constantly have information. Uh, my publisher says, well, you know, we'll publish an updated version of your book every semester if you can provide it. And that's their, their model. They just keep, that way they can have the most recent examples, recent sites, and, and all of that. And it's, it's a real challenge. John, I'll, congratulations. So I was um, living in, you know, living, teaching in this county over the years in the post beach edition, not just because it's a undeveloped uh, area, but there's been a lot of changes in Africa where they not really affected the economic development. Well, that, that is a great question. You should have given it to me this morning. I haven't thought about it some, but I think it has. It, it, this is a very teaching-oriented university, so I, I, when I think about this book, I think about individual students and experiences that I have. NAFTA is a good example. If you go back a couple of decades here, and, and even even more, you can see the a lot of the trade issues that have developed in this county, a lot of the jobs that, that were shipped off right to, to China and other parts of the world. So that it finds its way in, into this book. So when we talk about you know global issues in the book, then uh, often the, the the view here in this in this part of the world is not is sometimes negative. My God, these are the people who took our jobs away and sort of an anti-trade. But this is a, a pro-free trade book. I mean, the belief that we should be trading with our neighbors and we should be developing those kinds of, of, of relationships. There are issues involved that we have to overcome with that. But this is a very very much a trade um, pro-trade book. But I'll say, as far as teaching here, probably the greatest impact is. Uh, is the fact that I've been able to teach in smaller classes. And in doing that, it's interesting. You get a lot of questions from students, and you say, I never thought of that. I just assumed they would know that, or I assumed that made sense to me. I need to go back, make a note, go back to my book and correct that, you know, or add some additional explanation or something that makes sense. Uh, I think so it's, it's a continuous improvement exercise that, that you, you work on. Somebody, when you look at management, you talk much about someone like uh, a Musk. You know, he's got SpaceX and he's done something the government said just couldn't be done in terms of air and spacecraft. And he's got Tesla, he's got Hyper. It, it, it's, how much of it is management and how much of it is just, you know, kind of a mad scientist kind of ideas? <coughs> Is there a management strategy in someone like us? Yeah, take all you can from the government. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that tongue in cheek, uh, we we have through tax dollars financed a lot of what he's done. Now, that having been said, Tesla's a great vehicle, and there's some advances there as well. But there's no simple formula, and that's probably the first thing that we talk about in, in teaching the class in chapter one is if there were a simple formula to doing this, all companies would succeed. You just check off your boxes, you do it, and that would it, that would be that, right? But there's not companies come and go uh, all the time. And, and Elon Musk is one of my favorite examples because there's there's a lot of innovation rolled in that, and, and I, I give him a lot of credit. But at the same time, he has also leveraged um, a lot of government support. Uh, you know, we pay for his his vehicles, but yeah, the space travel, the electric vehicles, a lot of progress there. 
Uh, it's a fascinating company. But uh, every company is different. And just when you think uh, a company is, you know, you look at an example like his and you think you've got it figured out, next semester it's, it's a little bit different. So that's one of the things uh, that I try to stress in the book is that, you know, things change. And it's, it's hard to predict exactly where you're going to be the next year. to do all sorts of great things in society. And I think sometimes we lose, um, lose sight of that. So if you think about just a company like Amazon, I mean, Amazon just sells stuff, right? But just think about what it's done for all of us. This allows us to buy stuff cheaper. And in doing so, that leaves extra money to deal with some of the problems that we have, social issues and, and everything else. So, uh, so I would say as far as companies that, that are valuable, any company is valuable. Um, and, I, and I would just, legal company is valuable. Um, you know, as far as companies that are able to succeed, wow, that's a tough question. Personally, uh, the more regulated industries, I think, are the most challenging ones, which would be things like banking, for example, a very difficult industry to, to compete in just because of the massive regulation. But there are companies that succeed and fail in every industry. And just when you think you figured out the one to be in, all of a sudden there's a downturn and the next one comes up. And that's what makes it an interesting field. Um, you know, you can come out, you can have people like stock pickers. They buy this stock, sell that stock. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, really, they, they have some idea that the next week they're telling you something else. It's, it's a moving target. And it's a lot of fun because those questions you ask are really compelling questions, but they're, it's almost impossible to give a good answer. If I had all the answers to that, then, you know, I guess I'd be worth billions and, you know, I'd be telling, you know what I'm saying? It's, well, they, they, they yeah. serve more service companies or less um, upshare thing than product well, when you say sure thing, in terms of it's easier to understand the business. Yeah. Right? In my mind, it's easier to understand a restaurant, right? Because yeah. you, you open up, you know, you rent your, your, your facilities, you hire somebody, you cook food, you sell it, right? The downside of that is everyone else thinks, thinks the same thing. So my neighbors are all doing the same thing, so I've got a really competitive market. That's why if, it, if you think about your town, you drive around, live in the same place for a few years, a lot of the restaurants turn over constantly because it's an easy business to get in. Everyone understands that, you know, if you can do good barbecue in your backyard or open up a restaurant, right? But then the next year you realize that nobody else wanted to buy your barbecue and it's a little more difficult than that. It's a highly competitive market. So that's the trap of thinking that if something is simple and makes sense to you, then you're likely to be successful because everyone else is thinking the same thing. And sometimes it's your ability to find a business that others don't understand. <laughs> something that you can do that someone else can't do that can give you that that great uh, insight. It's a great question. Though. Thanks to both our authors. We're either going to be here for a regular reception. We've got some refreshments in the back and uh, take time to meet the authors, do some business with uh, Jay if you want to, and uh,
thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Next Tuesday, 3 o'clock, same time, same place. Thank you.